Good afternoon and welcome to another episode of Condo Insider. Uh, my name is Jane Sugimura and this is a show uh, for uh, people who live and work in condominiums and we uh, have uh, we talk weekly on issues that we hope are important to you. Uh, they're important to us and uh, today I'm continuing with my series about meeting the candidates because this is an election year and we've got everybody running for office, We've got <laughs> running, people running for office in the state Senate, the state house, uh, the governor, the lieutenant governor, and our city uh, county councils. And today, uh, my special guest is uh, Senator Sharon Murray Walkie of uh, Senate District 12. Thank you for being with me, Sharon. Oh, thank you for inviting me, Jane. It's wonderful to see you and to okay. be with you today. Well, you know, uh, I, like I've been saying, and I've been preaching on this for a long time, condominiums, you know, we have lots of issues and we have lots of issues that bother us. And, uh, and you know, I keep telling people, you know, if you're, you know, if you, uh, you know, want to get involved, you have to become best friends with your elected officials. And, you know, so, you know, and hopefully these uh, shows regarding candidates will bring, you know, will allow our, you know, condo uh, owners, uh, and residents to learn about the candidates who just basically decide their fate, right? Our, our fate is in your hands and, and we kind of trust you to, you know, do your best for us and listen to us and, 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 and fight our battles for us. Well, anyway, uh, you're running for re-election yeah. in District 12. And why don't you give us some background about yourself for people who don't know who you are? Okay. Uh, so I um, I have been in office, as Jane says, for for almost four years, and and I am in one of the most condo dense districts. It's Kaka'ako, Waikiki, and some of the Makali Makali Mo'ili Ili area. So condos and condo living is um, is, is not really that supported across the board because most of our our communities, uh, neighbor islands especially, are not in uh, multifamily dwelling units. So, so it's really important for you to know your candidates who actually live in condos as I do. Um, and so I have been living in the Kaka'ako area for uh, quite some time. I, um, I, my background is um, coming from the university, uh, working in public policy and prior to that uh, in the governor's cabinet for human resources and also for labor. Um, and, and my, my whole um, thrust in coming into, into public service has been a long time uh, with, with what I do is, is, is really very much interested in policy and in, in serving the community. But I came into the legislature because uh, my neighbors and I were seeing that uh, there were all these buildings coming up around us, these luxury condos uh, coming up around us. And we had no idea, as Jane says, you know, know your elected officials. We had no idea. And all we saw one day in the Star Advertiser was like 28 buildings that were um, renderings coming up in our neighborhood. And, and that's when we said, whoa, what's happening? We started to get in touch with our elected officials and some were more responsive than others and and um and uh the one who wasn't um we all decided you know we should we should be um changing who can't re represent us so as jane says it's really important especially condo dwellers because you kind of are in your own little world uh and you say okay i just want to make sure that my building you know is is taken care of but when you look at it it's a lot of condo issues are critical uh, to our well-being, and um, and if you don't have people to support that, and uh, you, you know you're you're um, not going to see the kind of support and issues that are important to to all of us. And you know one of the, one of the things in your background is you were a, a founder of Kakako United, right? So why don't you tell us about that? I mean, what okay. was that all about? 
And that is exactly what I, I was saying, that our neighbors came together and said, you know, they're building high rises, luxury condos. They're not building affordable housing. They're not building for our community. We are not having any neighborhoods. There's no parks and green spaces. Uh, we really need to come together. And as we went to, and, and in Kaka'ako, uh, it is overseeing, the zoning is overseen by a state agency, not a county agency. That's the Hawaii Community Development Authority. We had no idea, you know, back then uh, what that was, what it did. And we started to have to do our homework, learn about it. And we found that unless you had a voice in the legislature, you couldn't really get much for the community. Uh, and so uh, Kaka'aku United was formed amongst my neighbors. Uh, and uh, we also wanted to have a quality of life because we had the, the mountains and we had the ocean and we didn't, it was separated by Ala Moana Boulevard. So it was, how do we get ourselves together as a community, small businesses, uh, residents, so that we can assure a quality a quality neighborhood and they started to build uh, or trying to build um, uh, luxury high rises on the uh, on the shoreline and again the community said we've got to come out and do something about it and I must say that uh, speaker Scott Psyche on the house side was very responsive and helped us but it was the senator who uh, blocked what we wanted to have done of, of of looking at more affordable housing, looking at the shoreline being open for the public. Uh, and so that's when uh, I decided to run on behalf of my neighbors. And that, that was the genesis of Kaka'aku United and how it became a real force in our, our little community. And, and basically your first campaign was a real grassroots effort. It was, right? yeah, no money, <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of love and a lot of hard work. I mean, we, we worked very hard that first campaign because we're, we're uh, running up against uh, a 10 year incumbent. So right. it, it was um, a lot of uh, grassroots visibility, you know, side waving, canvassing, walking door to door where we could, because, uh, you know, we're in a condo district, so it's, we had to, you know, send out postcards, uh, but you know, really on a shoestring. Uh, but I think it, the people people saw the need for coming together, um, and and we uh, we actually won by quite a landslide. <laughs> so it tells you people coming to even a small group of renegades <laughs> can pull together the excitement, the the interest, the the real. Um, importance of coming together as a neighborhood, as a community, that you can make a difference. And that's, I guess that's a lesson to our viewers, you know, if they really care and if they have concerns, I mean, if, if they don't want to run for office you know, like you did, I mean, they got to become best friends with their elected officials, right? Correct. Right? Oh, I'm sorry. We have a problem here in the Capitol. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't know what to do. We've had, and leave the building, we've had a bad system here at the Capitol. I'm sorry. I don't know if we. Do not use <laughs> this is the. This is your capital at work. <laughs> okay. I think okay. We're okay for now. Yeah. All right, but you know, you know, let's get into some of the issues. Some of the issues, you know, regarding. Um, uh, you know, that, that you've had to become familiar with now that you're a legislator that affect condos. And one of them uh, is making, uh, you know, dealing with uh, requests for reasonable accommodation, right, under fair housing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, that, that covers a whole uh, broad area because it, it involves disability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and because of the Fair um, Housing Act, federal, we have to follow that and, and part of that effort is uh, looking at what are assistance animals because some people want to have their animals there uh, and the condo doesn't you know, allow it but if it is an animal that is helping you with your disability and now the, but the law 
that we just passed requires um, that there be a connection between the animal that really is a service. I really, I do need it for my disability and you just need some kind of written certification from some health professional. It, it is, it's the balancing. You live in a building with, you know, a hundred other people. Some people want you to have dogs, others don't. Uh, and, and yet if you're disabled and this is a, either a comfort animal or an animal that you need uh, to, to out guide you, um, you should be able to keep that animal. So, so the law now is very clear that you can have one and it's not just dogs, it's any animal. It, it's going to help you in your disability. And, and there is um, the requirement that the, the association allow for that to happen. And, and if you have a question about whether the person is disabled or not, you could ask them uh, to get some kind of certificate from their doctor or some health professional saying that they need the animal for their daily living. And, you know, there's, there are, you know, other than that, uh, you know, we have, uh, you know, it became an issue this year in the Senate with uh, electric vehicle charging stations. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, and, and we run into this problem a lot. And, you know, so I'm glad that we have people like you who live in condominiums who understand condominiums, because I think the bill basically required all multifamily uh, buildings to have plans in place to have elect their, their, you know, electric vehicle charging stations in each parking stall. And mm -hmm. what they didn't understand is, well, number one, retrofitting for an existing building that doesn't have charging stations, that is, you know, that costs a lot of money. And when you're talking about putting charging stations in an existing garage with 300 parking spaces, I mean, that's like, you know, it, 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 it really doesn't make sense to a condo dweller because, you know, even though there is a goal that by what, 2040 or 2050, yep. uh, there's going to be, you know, uh, a lot more electric vehicles, it's not going to be 100%. So why do condos have to spend money to make sure that every parking stall has got a charging station, especially with technology that's evolving? And who knows, you know, by 2030, you might be able to do it remotely instead of having a charging station in every, you know, stall. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this was a, an yeah. issue, this session. And, it, and, and the thing is, you know, when you've got the advocates, and, and I'm a clean energy advocate, but, you know, you, you, you get um, people who are, are saying it's 100% or nothing, right? And, and yet, when you look at the cost, and the cost for the, the, the condo dweller, it's, it's not cheap. I was one of the first um, to, to get a charging station in my stall. And it cost me $2,500 just to get the, the um, electrical wiring from my stall to where the, uh, the meters were and that the, the charging was happening. And, and it really depends where it is in your building. And it, it had to go like two blocks in my building um, to get to um, the, the electricity. The, the, so it's not, if you say one in every stall, it, it is not realistic, nor is it cost effective. Um, perhaps they might come up with a bank of, of, of electric charging chargers where people can plug in and, and um, either pay for it or split the cost among the users. But, but there, there's got to be other ways in which uh, we can get to 100% renewables. Yeah, so this is a work in progress. And it so is. I'm glad we've got somebody like you, you know, who understands, you know, you know, what it's like to live in a condo and it, it, exactly how you get payment on, you know, making these uh, retrofits, uh, because it's hard to explain to you know, to uh, uh, a legislator who might be an energy efficient advocate but doesn't live in a condominium that, right. hey, you can't, you can't do it for every stall. And it doesn't make mm -hmm. sense based on the fact that you've got evolving technology now, you know, and, and especially since, you know, it's a common area and you, you can't ask the owners to pay for the cost of charging every, you know, having chargers in every stall 
when you don't have electric cars that are going to take up those stalls. You know, so so that's something that you know really kind of hard to explain. And you know, also if, if you're is if you're in your own home, you know, you could just plug in. I mean, that's basically it. You could just actually plug in, like you plugged in your your washing machine, you know. Uh, but if you're in a condo where you're you're really with a hundred or two hundred other people, your home is with two hundred other people. So you can't expect everybody to have EVs. On the other hand, you can't expect people with EVs to be subsidized by those who don't have EVs. And it's it's costly not only in terms of connecting, but also um, with your charge because each month my bill comes on on my own bill for the, the using the charger so so there are a lot of it's it's not that easy um, to 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 split the cost among those who use it um, all of those need to be worked out and and it's really up to the association while the the law requires that we don't prohibit anybody from putting in their charger it doesn't um, it, it really is not practical. Um, and it's and up right to now, the like, like in your case, you have to pay for it, right? I did. I did. You, you yeah. have to pay for it. The association wouldn't pay for it. No, no. Right. And they shouldn't because it's my, my, my car, my charger. Uh, but, but it is costly. Right. And, and this year, you, you guys had to deal with an omnibus bill that started in the House. And that was House Bill... Uh, 2272, and that dealt with uh, a bunch of issues, you know, like electronic voting and remote meetings and things like that. Yeah, you know, I think I think it's a really good bill. I mean, it 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 covers a lot of areas, but what for me it does is is that you know condos have been around a long time. There's a lot evolving. Um, we learned from the pandemic that you can't really require everybody to come in to a meeting. Uh, so we look at remote technology. We learned that uh, we have a Marco Polo that, you know, a lot of times the boards don't. Okay, this is my, 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 my own observation is that you want to be elected. So you don't want to charge your, your uh, association members. So you kind of don't do a full on reserve and you don't pay for um, what is costly in terms of your capital improvements. Uh, so you, you leave yourself open to a lot of costs because you don't plan forward. And this bill, um, I think was really a good bill in terms of looking at reserves, uh, looking at uh, the uh, association having a lot more or the board having a lot more uh, flexibility, whether it's in terms of changing the de declaration or changing the bylaws or, or uh, meetings, uh, special and regular meetings. It really does give the flexibility so you, you feel that the board, just like legislators are for, the, for the, their constituents in their district, you can be more flexible to deal with evolving problems and that you can have a give and take and, and, and work with um, your constituents or your association members. So, so it, it covers a lot, but it's, I think it's over time, and Jane, you know better than, than, than I do about how it's evolved over time and there's all these needs and requirements and yet the, the law hasn't changed to keep up with how it's changed over time and our needs have changed over time. Right, and one of the important things too uh, in, in the bill is it changes the reserve study uh, requirement. Oh. It extends it from 20 years to 30 years. And so, you know, uh, and what we found out and, uh, you know, we only found out, we found out the hard way because, you know, buildings were told that they had to start, you know, replacing their piping system, right? because their pipes were failing. And, and, and it was like, but well, we don't have the money for it. And then the owners got all mad and said, how come, I mean, we have these reserves, but pipes were not in the reserves because mm. they're not supposed to fail mm. every 20 years. I mean, that's how the reserves are set up. And now we know that the 75 year 
clay pipes don't last 75 years. We know that. <laughs> yeah, we know that because, because the, the structural engineers went into a building and said, ah, they're failing. And our professional opinion mm. is you got to replace all the pipes. And it's not unusual. It's starting, you know, with, with the older buildings that are about 40 years old. I mean, that's what's happening. They're saying you got to replace your pipes because you have so many, you know, leaks that are happening. And, and that's why a lot of your insurance deductibles are going up. I mean, lot, oh, most of the, all the buildings have got these huge deductibles. My building's got a $50,000 deductible. And that's because we have claims where, you know, there are water pipes that fail. And, and I, I'm sure soon we're going to have to consider, you know, putting, replacing pipes. But because of the, the, the recent failures, I mean, now associations have a reserve for their pipes. And now we're amending the, the declaration so that you have to, you know, anything at least 30 years, you have to put in your reserve. So that will take care of your pipes, you know, and other things that people weren't, you know, really, you know, we didn't consider. And, you know, um, and it was a hard lesson for a lot of condos. And, you know, so there was a lot of turmoil. But, you know, I think uh, now going forward, uh, you know, buildings are going to be required to, you know, look at these, cap, you know, pipes and electricity and other things because they don't last forever. I mean, that's mm -hmm. the message. The <laughs> message is these things that you, you all take for granted. I mean, they, they don't last forever. They break. They break down. They have to be replaced and it costs money. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we got to start, you know, socking things away. So that's one of the things in this bill. I think that, that's a good thing. And the, the good thing also, um, Jane, is that in the reserve, it requires an independent assessment uh, every three years so that you can get somebody, not just the condo owners at the board say, hey, yeah, it looks good, you know, yeah. but really have a professional looking at it and saying, okay, if it's a pipe, how long, what is its life a span? And then what is, what is it for electrical? What is it for like spalling? The buildings are all getting small right because we don't think about that but if you know what the what the lifespan is and when you really do need to look at changes i think that's what the reserve is is supposed to do for us is get somebody that really does know buildings and all of the parts of your building so that you don't have a building crumbling under you or you know fire and not having um you know the 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 um um materials that could protect you so i think it's very very important to to have that information up front and deal with it before it's too late right and and you know let me talk to you let me ask you about something that's not a state issue but it it, it you know it affects a lot of condos and that's a city fire safety ordinance that you know and and i've been getting a lot of you know complaints about it concerns from condo owners like you know, what are we going to do about this and that, you know, that the ordinance requires of us. And so, you know, what I've done is I, I, I keep telling them, you got to call your council member, your council members who you don't complain to me, you got to complain to your council member. And half of them don't, don't know, don't know who their council members are. <laughs> and, and, you know, this is, this is, this is a, a good example of why you have to be best friends with your elected officials, because mm -hmm. this is a brand new law. And it is, it's creating a lot of tumult, you know, in, in a lot of issues with condominiums, because this is something new. I mean, they have to do life safety evaluations or install sprinklers, right? And sprinklers are expensive. And, and you know, and especially with the older buildings, I mean, they've got, you know, they, you know, they, they already have to, you know, uh, fix their aging building. They have spalling problems. A lot of them have to replace their pipes. Right, and we're not talking about ten thousand dollar jobs. We're talking about millions of dollars that already have to be spent, and now they got to deal with fire safety. I do. I do want to say something because um, Speaker Scott Psyche, uh, who also in a condo dense area, he's he's my representative uh, in, in our district in Kaka'ako. Uh, this was a concern of a lot of the residents. Uh, you know, um, insurance policies, the premiums going up because of all of the requirements now. And so he's um, coordinating a town hall 
on June 30. And I wanted to share that with you because it is a concern among a lot of people, especially in older buildings, you have older people on fixed income. So we really do need to help people get through this. And we can't be raising insurance rates uh, as, as, um, and find ways that we can help them whether it's through incentives to, um, to um, building owners or um, insurance, insurance agencies of how we can help uh, these, these older buildings that have, don't have the sprinklers in them. So um, they, this is a, being, a panel being put together by the um, Hawaii Insurance Council. So I think if I could sh screen share that, I would like to share it with your viewers so that if anybody is interested in looking at insurance rates going up and what is the impact on, on the new um, law or can there be changes to the city law uh, on, on uh, evaluations and, and fire prevention and, and the sprinkler systems, um, this might be where you can ask some people questions um, that have to deal with this day in and day out. Okay, it's Thursday, June 30th, six o'clock to seven o'clock. It's a virtual town hall. And, um, and you can call, let me, let me just give you a number. You could call 586-6100. And you can say that you watched Condo Insider and heard about this town hall uh, it's called Hot Topics for Condo Owners, but it's really uh, the Hawaii Insurers Council, Atlas Insurance, Pyramid Insurance, and the State uh, Federal Credit Union. So they are insurance questions that you can ask about, um, well, anything to do with your condo. So I think it might be worthwhile if you can um, listen in on this and ask questions So because it is a, a Zoom chat. You can have a chat with, with them. Okay, well, thank, thank you for that information. And, you know, we have run out of time. Oh, so, no, that went too fast. <laughs> yeah, we, we have run out of time. And so, you know, I, I want to thank you for being our guest. And I want to thank our viewers uh, for watching this episode. And uh, remember to, to go out and, you know, like I said, make friends with your elected <laughs> officials. Be, you know, know, find out who your candidates are and ask them really hard questions about what are you going to do for us if I, if, if, you get elected. If I vote for you, you get elected. So you know, have that conversation. And please join us next week for another episode of uh, Condo Insider. And thank you and mahalo. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.